The objective of this video is to introduce magnetic circuit analysis tools for studying inductors and transformers. And this is the first video in a unit that is going to lead us to designing inductors and transformers. But before we can design the components, we need to know how to study the components. And we'll do this by using two of Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law and Ampere's law. The first equation that we'll be using, Faraday's law, says that the curl of our electric field is equal to the negative partial derivative of our magnetic field with respect to time. And this should be familiar to you from your E and M course, your fields course. But we won't be working with it in its vectored form. Rather, we'll be working with it in an integral form, which allows us to calculate the back EMF. So this equation here, which says that our voltage is equal to d phi dt. And another word for this type of voltage is back EMF, which is sometimes written as epsilon, or EMF, electromotive force. So let's unpack this. What does this mean? Well, this says that if we have some kind of loop, so perhaps we've got a loop of a conductor here, that we will notice an induced voltage if we have a time varying field that goes through that loop. So I'm sketching here a magnetic field, B, that goes through the loop. So this, this magnetic field goes to the cross section of this loop. And Faraday's law says that if we were to integrate along the contour of our loop, that we would notice a voltage if B varies as a function of time. So let's introduce a few things here. First of all, the integral of b over an area is equal to phi. And in our class, we're going to assume that, that magnetic fields are always constant with respect to a cross section. So we can bring b outside the integral and just say that b times an area is equal to phi. So what is b? b is our magnetic field. Sometimes it's also called a flux density. And it, for our class, it has units of Tesla. And what is phi? Phi is our magnetic flux. And it has units of Weber. One Weber is equal to one Tesla meter squared. So the magnetic field really is the flux density of this magnetic flux. So you can think of the magnetic flux, if you want to relate this to an analogy of currents, you can think about our magnetic field as being a current density. And you can think about our magnetic flux as being the current. So if you integrate your current density over the surface area of your conductor, you get the total current flowing in that conductor. Similarly, if you integrate your magnetic field over the total surface area of something, you get the total magnetic flux through that surface. The second of Maxwell's equations that we're going to be talking about is Ampere's law. And for our class, we don't worry about this term right here. We're neglecting any electric fields. And we again write this in its integral form and making use of the H field. So ex we'll explain the terms of this equation. But we're going to note that similar to Faraday's law, we can talk about this I enclosed term here as being an MMF, or magnetomotive force. All right, so let's unpack this. First of all, we define a mathematical field called the H field, which is related to our magnetic field by 1 over mu times B. And the H field is sometimes referred to as the field intensity, or just the H field. But it is a mathematical construct. It is not a physical quantity. And this term mu is equal to mu naught times mu r. It is the permeability. And within here, we have this first term mu naught, which is a physics constant. And this physics constant is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 newtons per amp squared, whereas this second term here, mu r, is referred to as our relative permeability, 
and it is a material property. For iron materials, it actually ends up being a function of the magnetic field in the iron, but we'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. So, Ampere's law in integral form. Let's give it some geometric meaning. Suppose that you have a piece of material like this, and inside your material is a bunch of current. And I'm drawing conductor cross sections. And each of these conductor cross sections, drawn like this, represents a conductor with current coming out of the page. So current is coming out of the page at us. If I had drawn it like this, that would represent a conductor with current going into the page. And you can remember this by thinking about an arrow. If an arrow is coming at you, you see just the tip of the arrow, and so you see a dot in the center of your circuit, or in the center of your conductor. If the arrow is going away from you, you see a cross because that are, those are the feathers of the arrow. So this, this notation is used for both current and fields or any vector really. So if you have a field that is coming at you, you're going to see a circle with a dot. If you have a field that is going away from you, you're going to see a circle with a cross in the middle or a plus in the middle. When we talk about this equation, we're talking about evaluating H on some contour inside this material. So this is the path that we're in integrating H around. And I enclosed is the total current that that path encloses. So it's equal to the integral of our current density over the surface area inside that path. In this case right here, if we know the total current flowing in each of the conductors that we've drawn inside this cross section, we can say that this is equal to the number of conductors times the current within each conductor, n times i. In general, I want to note that in this class when we do our fields analysis, we're going to, be cons we're going to assume that we have fields that are constant within the cross sections and that are constant over periods of length that we'll define. So they, they, the fields do not vary within a given cross section and they do not vary as a function of length. And the reason that we make this assumption is that it allows us to say that the integral of b dot dA over a cross section is simply equal to b times a, b times our area. And it allows us to say that the integral of h dot dl over a length is equal to h times that length. We're going to now move into a couple examples. Uh, these are going to be example inductors that will illustrate how to apply the field equations that we just derived, or that we just summarized. And so the two key equations from here are Faraday's law and Ampere's law. So suppose that we have this toroidal core and we've wrapped around it a coil that has n turns and we're defining the current as being into the coil as, as indicated here and the voltage across the coil as indicated over here. What we want to do is we want to use Ampere's law to determine the field within the core, the total flux that's flowing within the core, and its inductance. In this core, we're going to assume that it has a cross section of A and a mean path length of L within the core. So we're going to assume that the the field takes this mean path length of L. We can draw an equivalency of this system down below where we note that, that our coil appears simply as a bunch of cross sections of, of a coil, each carrying the same terminal current, I. So I've drawn this down below just to highlight how we're going to evaluate the integral of h dot dl. When we evaluate, when we evaluate it along the contour of that mean path length, which is the center of this core, we see that we are enclosing several cross sections of conductors, each carrying the same terminal current, i. And remember that we've assumed that fields don't vary over a cross section, which means that we can bring h and l outside of that integral. 
And note that it equals a total current enclosed, which gives us this expression. And we can use this to calculate our field by noting that B is equal to mu H. So already we've, felt we've answered our first question. We know the expression for the magnetic field within our core as a function of the current that is flowing in the coil. And we've done that by evaluating Ampere's law of h dot d, the integral of h dot dl along this contour. Noting that h does not vary as a function of length, we can pull h and l out of that integral. And then we just need to sum up the total current that is inside our core, inside the contour we're integrating over. And we simply do that as being n times i, where n is the number of turns. Now we're ready to find our flux. And all we do is we multiply b times a cross-sectional area a, and we get an expression for our flux. Now I want to pause here and note a couple interesting things that have come up. I started the lecture by saying that our flux looks like a current. So we'll say that this is, this is building up an electric analogy, electric circuit analogy. And we can say that our that the term Ni looks like a voltage or an MMF. And if we liken this to Ohm's law, we can observe that we've labeled a current, we've labeled an MMF, and we can note that this term in the middle looks like a resistance, or actually one over a resistance. And in the magnetic analogy, we can call this a reluctance. So use the script R. So if we, if we rewrite Ohm's law using this analogy, we can say that Ni is equal to phi times our reluctance. And let's work with that reluctance term a bit. So we just know that reluctance is equal to 1 over mu A by L, which means it's equal to L by mu A. I want you to note that for a conductor, Resistance is calculated by L over sigma A, where L is the conductor length, sigma is the conductivity of the material, and A is the cross-sectional area. So this is a very similar form where we replace conductivity of a conductor with permeability of the material that the field is in, in this case, likely a steel, some kind of iron steel. And note that the permeability in iron which is usually what we use, which is our magnetic material of choice for, for transformers and inductors, is at most 10 to the four times larger than the permeability for air. While in the electric circuit, sigma in copper is around 10 to the 20 times higher than the conductivity of air. So this is an important thing to keep track of. In magnetic circuits, we talk about leakage flux. In electric circuits, we can talk about leakage current. But the difference is that leakage currents are very, are very small. Leakage current refers to some current perhaps traveling through the atmosphere or through air instead of through the intended copper traces on your circuit board. Whereas a leakage flux talks about a field traveling through air instead of its intended path through a magnetic circuit. And leakage fluxes, are orders of magnitude larger than leakage currents because of this discrepancy of, of permeability in iron versus conductivity in copper relative to air. We'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the lecture, but now let's continue developing this example. So we found an expression for B and for phi. So phi was down here and B was up here. Let's now find an expression for inductance. And we know from, from, from our prior circuits classes, from your undergraduate circuits class, you know that inductance is defined as being flux linkage divided by current. This is the definition of inductance. It's a notion, it's a concept that we introduce to keep track of the relationship between flux linkage and current. And a little reminder about what flux linkage is. We, in this class, we'll represent it by the symbol lambda, and it refers to the total flux that links a coil. And it has units of Weber turns. So if a single turn of a coil 
is linked by the flux within the core. So we have a we have a flux phi that's flowing through our core. And if we were to wrap a coil around this core one time, it would have flux phi passing through it. The total flux that links the coil must be n times phi, which if we plug in what we found for phi, we see that's equal to and now we are ready to solve for our inductance. And we get that's equal to n squared over the reluctance of our circuit. And this is an important result. Reluctance was just dependent upon geometric parameters. Geometric parameters of our core, of the path that the field has to take. Remember it's equal to L divided by mu times A. So the path length divided by the material permeability times the cross-sectional area of the material. And n is the number of turns that we decided to wind on to the material. So if you double your turns, you quadruple your inductance. Finally, we've now found, so we've now, we've now found all the variables we were asked to find. We've got b, phi, and l. Let's add a bonus question to this. What is v? What is the voltage that's induced across our, our conductor, our, our coil. What is this voltage? To answer this, we'll use Faraday's law. So V is equal to D phi dt. This would be voltage of a single turn of our wire, of, of one loop around our core. But in our case, we actually have n turns. So therefore, V is equal to n D phi dt or equivalently, in terms of flux linkage, it's equal to d lambda dt. And lambda is equal to L times i. So this ends up being equal to L di dt, which is a familiar equation, or at least it should be a familiar equation at this point in the course. Next, let's consider a second example. Again, this is an inductor. So now we have, now we have a, a core with an air gap, and our air gap has a certain length, we'll call it LG, and it has a certain cross-sectional area, and our core also has a, has a cross-sectional area. In this case, we want to find the field in our core, the field in our gap, and the total flux that's circulating when I is known, when the current is known. And to do this, we're going to again assume the flux takes a certain mean path when it's in the core, which is the sum of L1 through L5. Which means that we want to, when we evaluate our integral for Ampere's law, we have one H field which is in our core and takes the mean path length, so Hm times Lm. And remember, we're evaluating this over the closed contour, so over that entire dashed line. So we must also include the H field that's in the air gap. So this length along this line is Lm. And actually, I should draw it the other way since our field is flowing this way. So we're, evaluate, we're integrating H along this path here to get Hm Lm. And then we're integrating H to our air gap to get Hg Lg, which completes our contour. And the total current that's enclosed within this contour is again going to be equal to ni, since we have n turns. n turns means our wire is wrapped around that core n times. So we can convert these H fields into magnetic fields by dividing by the permeability of each region. And finally, we can note that we have a conservation of flux going on. So the total flux that, that travels through a cross-section of our core is going to be equal to the cross-sectional area of our core times the field in our core, but it's also going to be equal to the total flux that crosses our air gap, which is the cross-sectional area of our air gap times the field in our air gap. And so this is called conservation of flux, or it's called the implication that, that the divergence of B is equal to zero in physics terms, or it's said to be true because we have no magnetic monopoles. That is, flux can't just simply begin and end. 
it has to complete a closed loop path, like current does. So while the electric field stops and starts at points of charge, there's no such thing as magnetic charge, which means that a magnetic field has to complete a closed loop path. We're now in a position to solve our equation. We note that the field in our core is simply equal to this total flux divided by the cross-sectional area of the core, and the field in our gap is equal to this total flux divided by the cross-sectional area of the gap. And note that the only way we're able to do this is that we're assuming that no flux is taking a path like this. That is to say, we're assuming that we have no leakage in this example. And we'll talk about what leakage is in a little bit. So now when we've said we've got expressions for Bm and Bg in terms of phi, we can now plug this in to our expression up above to get an equation that we can actually solve. And we can note that this first term here is the equivalent reluctance of our core. That is the equivalent reluctance of trying to push a field to this entire region here. And the second term is the reluctance of our air gap. That is the reluctance of this region. And we can now actually draw this as a circuit. We can see that we have an MMF source, Ni, trying to push a field, phi, through a reluctance, which is Rm, and a second reluctance, which is Rg. And if we know values for Am and Ag, we can solve this circuit. We can find we can go backwards to so we can first solve this equate this circuit right here to get our value of phi. And then we can plug phi into these expressions up here to get Bm and Bg. And we've now solved our equation. Finally, I want to do a little housekeeping here. So we've been referring to leakage flux throughout this. Let's now clarify what that means. So if you have some, some iron core with that's wound like we considered in this last example, and you have a current flowing through it, that means you have a field. And some of your field will take the path we've been considering. So each of these lines I'm about to draw is a different, is a different field line or a different flux line. So some of your field will take this path that we've been considering so far. If you excuse my sloppy drawing here. The, but there will also exist other flux lines that will take a path like this. And also will take a path out here around the conductors that does not actually even enter the core. So we call these we call these flux lines our leakage flux lines. And we call these flux lines that stay within the core our magnetizing flux. Our magnetizing flux goes where we want it to go. It's entirely confined within the core. While our leakage flux lines go where we don't want them to go, they are partially or entirely within the air regions. And so in our example so far, we've been solving for the magnetizing flux, phi m. We've been actually ignoring the leakage flux, phi leakage. And we can write this out in terms of, of a total flux linkage. So we can say that lambda, which is equal to n times phi, has a magnetizing and a leakage component. And we can also write this out in terms of an inductance, since l is equal to lambda by i we can see that we have a magnetizing portion and a leakage portion. And we call the total inductance, that is lambda by i, we call this our self-inductance, Ls. And lambda m by i is our magnetizing inductance. And lambda leakage by i is our leakage inductance. And so you can see that the equivalent circuit of this inductor that we've drawn up here would have a leakage component and a magnetizing component. If you're, you're being really honest with yourself, it also has a resistive component too. The resistive component is due to the conductivity of the wire that you've wrapped around your core.
Finally, I want to remark about a phenomenon called magnetic saturation. So when we've been talking about our magnetic field, um, we call it the flux density or the magnetic field, so it's the density of flux within a region. And if we talk about it in terms of an iron region where the permeability is greater than one, we mentioned earlier that that permeability ends up becoming a function of your field. And, and so it's typically, and so what a manufacturer of a steel will do is they'll provide you a graph called a BH graph or a BH curve, which will plot your magnetic field in units of Tesla as a function of your H field in units of amps per meter. So that's, that's how much excitation, how much current you're applying to your core. And they'll give you a graph of how the field behaves. And on this graph, you'll have a region where the field behaves very linearly. And this will be called the linear region. And then you'll have a value where your field appears to saturate. And this will be called the saturation level of the steel, or B sat. The slope of this characteristic in the linear region is simply equal to mu, your permeability. And remember that mu is composed of mu r times mu naught, and mu r is a component that saturates. This ends up varying as a function of, of magnetic field. Well, mu naught is constant. So when we design our inductors and transformers in our next lecture, we'll be choosing a value of B that is below B sat. So that is to say, we'll be choosing a maximum allowable value of B for our design that keeps our inductor or transformer in the linear region. As long as we're in the linear region, we can say that our inductances are constant. But when we start to enter saturation, our inductances end up becoming a function of current, and this creates a headache. So in power electronic devices, we want to maintain linearity, so we design our device to operate in the linear region. That is to say, we do not let our field go past some maximum, some maximum value. We keep B less than B max. So in summary, we've introduced magnetic circuit analysis tools for setting inductors and transformers. This is built off of concepts that you should be familiar with from your undergraduate E&M course, your undergraduate fields and electric and magnetic fields course. We've used Faraday's law and Ampere's law to create expressions for our voltage and magnetic field in terms of qu circuit quantities. And then we've developed this to analyze simple magnetic circuit shapes, such as this toroid, this toroidal inductor, and this rectangular inductor down below. Finally, we've remarked upon the definition of leakage and magnetizing inductances, and briefly introduced magnetic saturation.